All right, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. My name is John Lacey and I'm a project manager here at the University of Tennessee System and I'll be your host today. So um, let's have a little fun this morning. Could everyone that's currently with us go ahead and type in the chat your location and let's see who the furthest person is away from Knoxville and whoever that person is gets to ask the first question to our, our panel of experts here. So um, go ahead and type that into the chat and Ellie, Nick, Ricky, if you guys could monitor that and let us know who the winner is later on, that'd be great. Okay, so this morning we're presenting, there's got to be a better way managing and leading remote workers. And just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in, in the chat box uh, in your Zoom control panel and someone, either myself or someone on our team, We'll bring them up during the Q&A portion of the session following the presentations. And we are recording this session. So we ask that everyone remain on mute throughout our time together. And if you have a question at the end that would best be communicated verbally, just let us know in the chat and we'll call on you and you get to uh, come up and ask your question. And of course, uh, we expect everyone to follow a code of conduct that is outlined on the webinar website. So if you're not familiar with that and if you wanna read about it, you can go there. <clears throat> okay, so here's what you can expect from us today. In this session, uh, it's really been designed to provide you with creative and bold ways of engaging with your remote workers. You'll hear stories of success on migrating your workforce to work from home, and you'll gain an understanding of the psychological effects of working remotely, and also learn some ideas on how to adjust your operation and management to improve your organization's success. And we also have a few hidden treasures that were, that were not included in the session description. So you'll have to hang on for those. And uh, we're already adding extra value for you this morning. So uh, be thankful you're tuned in. <laughs> we're thankful you're tuned in. Uh, so do we have a, a winner on the distance yet? Or are we going to, we do? We have someone awesome. joining us from Brazil. Brazil. Oh, <laughs> winner, wow. winner. Winner, winner. Awesome. Awesome. So glad to have you here. Thank you so much. Okay. So who that, who that person, I don't remember the name. Maybe I was talking over you, Ellie. Apologize. But whoever they are, they get to ask the first question when we get to that uh, time in our presentation. So now it's time to introduce our presenters. We have with us today, Scott Wilson. And Scott, if you'll, yeah, Scott is the Vice President of Corporate Communications and Community Relations at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee. In his role, Scott leads the Blue Cross corporate communications team, which manages the company's internal and external communications. He also oversees its community relations team that supports the company's charitable giving and civic engagement across the state. And through the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee Community Trust and Blue, Cl Blue, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee Foundation, as well as Team Blue, its employee volunteer program. Scott is a UT Chattanooga graduate and a member of the Leadership Tennessee class of 2018, and also the Harvard University School of Business Young American Leaders Program in 2017. So welcome, Scott. Thank you. We also have with us uh, Sean Walker. Sean is a beloved professor of management at the College of Business and Global Affairs at UT Martin. Sean's research interests in primary teaching areas assess the impact of psychological phenomenon on human resources and organizational behavior. Additionally, Sean is a licensed minister and mediator, which provide him with training to educate students, colleagues, and external agents on how to reach mutually acceptable agreements when faced with conflict within the organization. And Sean has earned a master's degree in business and a doctorate from Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. So welcome, Sean. Thank you, everyone. And with that, we'll, well, we'll begin with Scott. Scott, take it away. Good morning, all. Thanks for... Uh... I almost said coming out, but attending uh, this uh, Zoom webinar. And I, I see Julie Rowe, I see you have uh, uh, brought an extra. So I'd, I'd like the numbers to reflect uh, that we have one more that who will be learning here today. And that's fantastic. That looks like a happy face there. Um, so I'm just gonna, as quickly as possible, tell you about how we here at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee um, figured out that we need to transition everyone home, that this pandemic uh, was unlike other things that you see in the news and we needed to 
uh, take some, some action really quickly. I, I remember, I'll start by saying our CEO is both a, uh, he's, he's a lawyer and a physician. He has a dual degree as well as many other things. His name is J.D. Hickey, and um, we benefit daily from uh, everything he brings to the table. But in this case, especially, he was monitoring this. Um, I remember in, in January, I was at a meeting in his office, and he said, you know, by March, uh, we, won't, we won't be in the offices. And <laughs> I said, what? I mean, I was really shocked, very startled, because we've all heard of these viruses right before it's overseas it's in a wet market it, and it never has breached our shores before and I was really startled because of course the numbers the news stories have been growing uh, through the winter um, but sure enough um, by March we were we were transitioning out and um, so to get to that here were our objectives when we realized we have 6,700 employees and we've got to make sure they can, our business continuity is very important. We're the number one uh, insurer in the state and basically we're a tech company. I know, you know, think of health insurance, but every relationship we have with our customers, with physicians, with pharmacy, all of it is all tech. And so keeping that going is important to the state of Tennessee and the people that we serve. So we realized we have to protect our customers and our employees, that one is, and they're the same really. Um, and that we, uh, once we started, got into it, we realized we need to be flexible. We need people to be able to work from home or come to the office. The point being, when we thought we were transitioning back in June, we may have to go back home. So we wanted to be flexible so that there wasn't this major equipment shift, which I'll get into in a second. Um, and while doing that, we had to maintain and enhance the culture of what it means to work here. Our employee engagement is phenomenal and through the roof. And it's funny, I um, haven't been at the office much, but when I got in today, this issue, can you see it? It's not showing up because it's yellow. Modern healthcare is what I'm showing you. And it's the October 12 issue. And my company, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee is listed nationally as the number one best place to work in healthcare. And that doesn't happen accidentally. It's very intentional. Again, I go back to JD Hickey in the, in the empathetic environment he's created in his time as our CEO um, for maintaining that. And the reason that's important is that how we serve our, uh, our customers, our, our, you know, how the care we give is dependent on how our employees feel about working. And so maintaining that isn't just um, to rank in a magazine. It, it has to do with the care that we are able to give and making sure that um, happy people you know, work harder. Um, yeah, and so then we wanted to intentionally create ways to connect. And this came after we were home for a couple months, we realized this is going on and uh, there are going to be psychological effects of working remotely. So um, it kind of broke down and I will say, we're also talking about an event that is ongoing, right? So we're, we're talking about something in, min, in the middle of it. So this is really more of a, an update than a, than a report. I keep looking over because you all are over here and I know that's uh, distracting, I'll try to do better. So in, in, in this, first of all, we had to transition everyone home. Again, we have 6,700 employees in the state. I'll start by saying that fortunately, the trend to work from home had been growing um, with us in the last few years, we had already transitioned 2,000 people home. So a little less than a third, uh, and that had been growing quickly. People um, like working from home, um, especially people, we have a lot of people who do phone work, whether you're giving direct customer care or working with clinicians, a lot of it doesn't have to be in our building here in Chattanooga on Cameron Hill. So we, we had a head start and we knew what they needed. It, this wasn't a mystery. However, it, it did require um, quite a scramble to get um, the equipment for that bimodal, um, you know, uh, the, the ability to work from home or here. So we, we established um, basically a drive-through service for initially you, you just took your laptop and went home and if you wanted to take a screen that was great we let people do that 
a lot of people neglected to do that or got home and realized, you know, this laptop is not going to work. I need more. And so we set up a system whereby you could just drive into our parking garage. IT had a system where you, once we knew who you were and what you needed, um, we got your screen for you. Um, a lot of people then uh, realized, and this was probably around April, May, uh, I want my chair. I want my office chair. So we had a whole new system of drive around, open the trunk, we'll, we'll put your chair in. So we had this whole, uh, our, our logistics people, there would be a whole seminar on what it took to make that happen. Um, but again, we had sort of a contactless system set up. Um, that went on really for quite a few months because no one, it sort of set in after a while that this is, this is going to be bigger than we thought and we're not going to be in the office as, as soon as we'd hoped. So um, that went on through, I'm going to say at least June of people changing their minds saying, I'm sorry, I do want that big monitor or I do want my chair, et cetera. So then once we, once uh, we and my communication team got home, um, we have a really deep, um, it's the most mature communication system I've ever been a part of. And I've worked at City Hall. I worked here once for uh, seven years. And then I went to an international automaker um, where I had a lot of resources. But when I came back to Blue Cross three years ago to run the foundation, I was knocked out by how deep our internet, it, it, it isn't just a cert you can do everything uh, you need to do uh, on the internet. So we had some tools and then we added some tools um, but we we knew we needed to start with the highest level communication our executives um, from our CEO and and all the top line executives were part of the early uh, messaging um, and yeah it says early and often I don't think you can communicate too much that's my number one takeaway um, you have to do it and it's it's hard for me to imagine you doing it too much because as this dissociation has gone on, there have been phases. And um, I sit in on meetings with, I have the community relations team and the corp comp team, and it's, I don't know, about 50 people total. Um, and I also, they're, they're friends and I have a policy where I don't reach out to coworkers on social media, but if they reach out to me, I'll friend them. So I also can follow, you know, their lives as we do on social media. And I also was able to track the sort of, hey, this is great, I love it, I'm with my dog, look at these pictures to, I'm missing people. And, you know, I mean, even depression, um, there were issues of that. And so we were, were flexible and um, we set up town hall meetings. Um, we, communication from the top um, started out weekly for at least the first two months and then it went bi-weekly as this went on. And then we started doing things to support um, work-life balance and uh, well-being, and I'll get to that in a minute. And then thirdly, you see the recognition column. That was, we, we knew that we had these tools and we wanted our employees to get engaged. Um, the dissociation was, uh, it's a word I keep um, coming back to, but um, we all zoomed out like uh, everyone here, um, but we realized that we needed, we. It couldn't just go this way. We wanted some information coming back and we had some tools to do that, um, which I uh, will get to in a second. Um, so after those initial, um, you know, we, we came up with some branding that I'll get to in a minute for, uh, again, originally we thought we'd be back in the office in June. And so we, we started planning for that and we, we um, I'm gonna skip ahead just to show you, you see this forward together. This was our campaign for return to office. Um, and it is our campaign for return to office. Um, notice we don't use the term return to work because um, everyone was working. And um, that's one thing that has been the case um, throughout is that we have, we're monitored, especially our people who, who work with our customers. Um, there's a very sophisticated way of, of course, those calls are monitored and tone and, uh, how long and resolution and we also um, have a, a system of um, reaching back out to the customer to see how that interaction went. So we have rankings um, and um, they are basically you could say zero to 100 and they've always been in the high 90s, um, which is why we're a very popular insurer in the state and we've been able to maintain that throughout. 
which is very interesting because of course, initially, if you recall, um, because of people being worried about the medical system, usage dropped. Um, but that's when our company took advantage of telemedicine. We were the first, um, the first insurer nationally to compensate telemedicine. It's a change we made um, really pretty quickly in this, I would say in the second month. A, a press release will prove it, but I don't wanna uh, jump out to find that. Um, that we were the first to go ahead and, and um, telemedicine had been growing over really years, but slowly. This is one of the things that the pandemic has done. It greatly uh, amplified the need and, um, and people's usability for telemedicine. And so um, our usage in some cases increased 800% and more um, uh, across the board. Uh, so uh, I have lost my train of thought now, but um, so we, we took advantage of this opportunity to um, keep those, make sure and monitor those numbers that they stay high. We also have um, engagement numbers with our employees, which is a different, uh, we employ a third party and they, um, they uh, reach out to our employees and everyone, uh, it's anonymous, they can communicate as freely as they want. And again, um, our numbers are, have always been in the high 90s, which is, you know, I, I most recently was in a manufacturing environment where those numbers are quite a bit lower, um, even in the best case, because manufacturing is, is, is different and, and um, it, it has its own constraints. Um, but so when I came back, I was blown away at how happy people are to work here. Um, and then it came time for the annual survey and we discussed, you know, should we do this in the middle of a pandemic? Are these numbers gonna be skewed? But we did it anyway, because we thought, you know, this is a real chance to see how we, are rated in the crisis, right? And so we went ahead with it and um, the numbers went up. Um, the engagement number overall went up by three points to again, it was already in the mid nineties and it went to the high nineties. And the, the measure of pride, energy and optimism in your job also went up three points, which is 22 points over the benchmark for our industry, which is again, stellar and why we're um, a, a place people like working. Um, and then again, the alignment, your alignment as an employee with the company's mission, um, up five points, again, high 90s. And then our agility, how you rank our company's flexibility in this went up seven points. So um, it, uh, it, it's gone well for us. Uh, I want to go back a uh, page to go over some of this. So things we talked about two uh, this filtered down from the top through management um, that our employees, where possible, be flexible with work schedules because people aren't just doing work, they're home with kids. And so that situation is going to be different for everyone. I'm just home with two large shepherd dogs and a couple cats and my partner uh, who works from home already upstairs. But a lot of kids, a lot of people had children children who had to be supervised for learning. And, you know, it's, it was the wild west, as you all know. So we encourage flexibility. Um, and that meant whatever it means for the employee. Um, if you can't do nine to five, if you can do seven to nine and, and then take a break for a few hours and come back late afternoon, whatever works for you, we encourage that flexibility through, throughout management. And then of course, once the, the issues with the dissociation and the separation came up, we really had to start encouraging everyone to use paid time off. Even though there was nowhere to go, it's important not to be you know, on those Zoom meetings and where, as you know, and we all discovered, you're watched more than ever. In, in a live meeting, you know, the who's looking at who generally follows the conversation, whereas here, someone could just be staring at, I'm gonna say, Nick Simpson's picture or Jared Bigham's, three-wheeler, right? I mean, who knows? And so there's this sense of really being focused on that, that caused stress for people. Um, we instituted some free online fitness programs, which um, people, our people really took advantage of and they included yoga and body weight fitness. And um, we partnered with a third-party vendor. Um, tutoring for kids, this was a big one that people really took advantage of. The company paid for it. Um, and then some uh, elder care and child care services we made available. Uh, you see this online library 
Um, our HR uh, made that available to everyone. And then this came in around summer where we realized um, we need to, we need to, after four o'clock, family time is kicking in, kids are getting restless. So we put a break at four, don't schedule meetings after four. Doing so would be seen as an act of war and a and hostile uh, move. Um, and the same thing really came a little bit later at noon. We needed to let people be free to take that break because um, Zoom calls and conference calls are wearing in a, in a way that's different than when you're live and in person. Um, and then again, we already have through our, um, what we offer our employees, these um, behavioral supports, but we enhance them and we communicated the access to them and, and had a lot of stories in our internal uh, uh, platforms, um, which include, as I said, a really deep intranet. And then we, um, at the same time, launched a phone app, which we couldn't have done it's coincidental, it was coming anyway, but it literally launched the weeks after shutdown or uh, you know, everyone had to leave the office and the uptake um, on our um, blue app was through the roof. I think I've gone on a little bit long. Let me, let me speed ahead here. Um, again, the branding forward together is both. Now it's everything, it's work from home and return to office. Um, our, our building is ready for whenever these signs are already out there to help steer people. Um, you see this document um, is uh, how, it's a how-to book um, when you're in the building. These were prepared for when people returned, but we went ahead and sent it out because people wanted branded masks. So since we had developed it for the return, we just boxed it up and sent it home. You see there's a stone coaster, a couple of masks, one that was company and one which is Team Blue, which is our volunteer workforce, some hand sanitizer and a note from our CEO, uh, thanking them for the work they're doing. Um, yeah, so one of the things, when this is the third pillar, when we were trying to encourage this two-way um, communication through our, through what we, we offer to our employees, um, we started featuring Zoom interviews, both stories about employees and um, their time at home. Um, we had contests for dogs. I'm sure you all did this thing or pets or kids you know, selfie contest. We started a high five program where an employee could um, shout out another employee. And then um, what proved to be, I mean, as a, I'm gonna, this is gonna, we're gonna have to do this from now on. We started a program called Good News Blue. You see the gentleman there with his thumbs up. He's one of my employees who has a particularly dry and witty sense of humor. And he serves as the host of this program. Um, the original logo, his child drew, um, and I actually thought we should have stayed with that logo, but eventually one of our designers uh, came up with this. Um, and he um, would basically host a weekly program of what happened, what's coming up. It was a way for us to communicate um, that was fresh. And then he would interview employees uh, throughout the company, um, some, serious, some joking. Um, it has been phenomenally popular. His Halloween show is coming out, uh, what is today, Wednesday, Friday. So we're looking forward to that. Um, it's been a big hit. Um, and then you see, uh, I'll get to the town halls. We started hosting town halls, um, uh, but then they got very important with what I'm about to move to when the um, racial issues um, happened in the middle of this pandemic. Share at Work is a platform we have. We've used this for years to solicit ideas on a topic, how to improve um, what we offer our, our uh, customers or um, what do, how can we help 10 care um, outreach or you know, just whatever the topic is, everyone can weigh in. But we also do things like how to improve your working environment. So we were able to do that about work from home. And in, that's how we implemented those things I talked about earlier, the behavioral health, the resources for exercise and children. That all came from Share at Work, where our people tell us and can, and honestly, this has been a, this has been a platform we used for several years. And they've learned that um, as long as everyone's civil, you can be frank and, and people are. And, um, and, uh, it's, it, it, it's, that especially came into play with the racial injustice issue. And then you see that app, Go Blue Tennessee, that um, again, sometimes fortune just smiles. And as a communicator, the fact that it was ready uh, two weeks after we went home uh, really 
uh, was uh, a blessing. Here's some quick, we also, I didn't even mention this, that we mailed um, these plastic core signs to all of our employees for their yards. Um, they're just thank yous to our first responders um, throughout the state. And um, I, I, I didn't, I thought it was a great idea. I, I didn't know it was gonna be, I mean, it was, went through the roof. We had demand for more, someone stole mine, I need another. I mean, it was a big deal. And you can see from these comments that it really meant something to the employees. The fact that we were thinking of these things because first responders in their community, every community appreciates their first responders. So this was a way for them to, to show that. Um, and so I was, um, again, that's one of those things where I was really glad that we were able to implement that idea. Uh, and we use funds that we normally use for things that are hosted here on campus. Uh, I think I, again, I need to hurry along. I wanna briefly state that in the middle of this, the, um, the issue um, with the, the police injustice and, and the deaths that were happening on our TV screens live really dropped a bomb um, in our uh, workplace and yours. Um, so we started by having, we have something called Blue Stream and we had our top management just started um, just expressing our anti-racism stance. We took out uh, full page ads in the major newspapers across the state um, to make it clear to uh, our customers, uh, the community and our employees that um, where we stand against racism and injustice. And then we started, we, ju we, just, um, we just let people sign up and uh, our CEO led the first, we had, I believe eight of these. And um, he just started by explaining our stance, what we had done. Um, of course, we already have um, lots of uh, corporate initiatives to um, enforce that and um, hiring initiatives throughout the company that we've <clears throat> been doing for years and that we get accolades for um, uh, as a place that um, actually enacts and honors um, uh, a diverse workforce. Um, and then we just opened and let people talk. And um, it, they were really uh, stark and frank and tearful. And um, it was, I think, eye-opening for some people um, to hear what um, people of color, the talk they have to have with their children. Or one of our top executives told a story about how he was, and, and he's someone who's an elegant dresser, full suit and tie, coming to work and um, pulled over by the police because they were looking for an African-American man in the area. You know what I mean? And, um, and it, it, this went on for quite some time. We, we just kept scheduling them while there was an appetite for people to talk and it was, um, yeah, rough and um, healthy for the company to do. We then uh, implemented a whole lot of other processes because we didn't want to just be um, signifying uh, while the news cycle was talking about this. So we started, we then started a video series where we went around to and opened it up. And we filmed videos. I actually um, filmed the, the introduction with our diversity officer and interviewed him first to introduce the video series. And then we had top management, um, people of color, um, whatever they wanted to talk about. Then that moved on to a series where we got top people um, and presented them with a topic to discuss in a round table and we, we filmed it. And then we offered this to, for managers to meet with their group watch the video and have their own discussion. So we started out high and went down and now we're letting anyone film a video and send it to this platform we, where we can all watch it. So this is something, um, the power of we, we call it. And we have several programs. We have um, diversity scholarships um, in healthcare under the same banner, but it's also how we've couched this program. We are hosting um, in major cities, uh, radio shows still uh, under the power of we banner. Um, yeah, and uh, so we created this dialogue uh, with our employees and we still have through a share at work, you see it on the screen there, we had a share at work um, topic on racism and injustice and what we can do here at work. And so as a result of that, we, um, we've added Juneteenth um, as a company holiday um, for everyone. We have made um, something that's been available for more than a decade 
probably 15 years, unconscious bias training, that's now mandatory for everyone company-wide. And we have an ongoing, as I mentioned, forum for, uh, for employees to discuss this topic. Um, I'll stop there. And um, I, I, I've, I've probably gone along too long and I apologize and we'll hand it over now to Sean. Thank you. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, just as Scott said, I wanna thank you all for being here and coming to this, this very unique presentation of a webinar. Uh, what I'll be doing now is focusing on how to get the most out of working from home. I would like to say, by the way, to John, when we do the questions, if Rafael from Brazil is able to ask the first question for being the farthest away, I think the youngest participant should get to ask the second one. So we'll have to allow Julie to, to jump in. Uh, good, good news, Julie. John said you're getting extra value. What he was talking about is uh, my lectures and preaching commonly put people to sleep. So if you ever have insomnia about your child won't go to sleep, need to take a nap, they're going to have this recording available for folks. So just play the recording within about 15 to 30 seconds. Your kids are out. Uh, you may even be out. So that that's not to take John's thunder away, but that was the extra value that he was actually talking about. But uh, you know, in all seriousness, you know, thank you, everybody. I appreciate this uh, that you're all here. Uh, I've been doing some research into how employees have felt during this time. And as you can see here, uh, the five most common negatively uh, expressed psychological states that employees are mentioning are regret, remorse, sadness, depression, as Scott had mentioned that some of the folks at Blue Cross have, have acknowledged, and isolation. And we all know what each of these are, but one of the things that I think has been the most interesting report coming from employees is people who said that they were previously thought they were introverts now we're saying they realize they weren't as introverted as they thought. Because when you take people out of the office space, even if you sit in your office for eight hours at a time and people just come and go and you're not really around it, you're a lot more extroverted than what you probably felt like you were. And now that you're at home and you don't get those interactions, that has made people realize that they're missing out on a lot of things. So what can we do for our employees to help them minimize what they're missing. I'm going to discuss in the next four slides is what the organization can do, what managers can do, what the employee themselves can do. And then in the last slide, I'm going to give some ideas or tips for what organizations can do to try to make sure that they succeed as we continue to move through this pandemic. As Scott accurately noted, we're not through this yet. You know, we're, we're, this is not hindsight. We're still dealing with this. So what can we do uh, as organizations to, to try to make the best of this? The one thing I will say, the key to all of this is to have fun. You know, you, you want to have a job that you have fun at. So we've got to find ways to, to help our employees have fun. And I uh, designed my presentation based off of that. Why well, have a bunch of words? Let's have some cartoon uh, character strips. So the first thing that we have to do from an organizational standpoint is help our employees develop a workstation at home. I think one thing we, we, we don't think about when we hire that employee in and he or she comes to the work, we've already designed the cubicle, the desk space, where the computer is, things of that nature. When folks go home, they may not have a defined workspace. You know, what's going to happen? It's just like college students. They want to work on their bed, but then they fall asleep and they don't do the work. They want to sit on the couch, but then that makes them want to turn the TV on. You want to go to the kitchen table. Well, then you just get hungry. So what we have to do is work with them and help them get the resources that they need, uh, including identifying a space in the home that makes sense for them to work and then make sure they have everything else they need. Uh, it goes back to what Scott was saying. Uh, some folks wanted their office chair. There is nothing like having a comfortable chair when you're working. So if we can find those ways, providing um, uh, you know, Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi access to our employees are huge. A second thing organizations can do is help employees develop effective to-do lists. 
As you can see here, make a to-do list is item one, check off first item, realize you already did two things on the list, now reward yourself with a nice long nap. It's not really an effective to-do list because you're not gonna actually get anything done, okay? Now you're gonna get the nap done, but you're not gonna get any of the work. So find a way to help them go, okay, I've got to do this, we need to cover this item, and include in that some sort of a time management component. But we need to be realistic with time management in the uh, COVID-19 era. Uh, what used to take me five minutes to do at work when a student would come into my office now may take 30 minutes, may take 40 minutes. Meetings in person that used to be able to be done in 30 to 45 minutes, the first 30 to 45 minutes is probably reminding, hey, John, you're still on mute. You, you got to unmute yourself. And so we, we do this literally with every single person that's doing it or trying to figure out how to screen share, or we, you know, we get distracted by all the things going on in our home. So that task that was performed in a short period of time, pre-COVID, it's not gonna happen as quickly. The last thing that um, the organization can do is help their employees figure out how to uh, use Zoom in a way that works for them, acknowledging just like Scott was talking about with Blue Cross, you're gonna have employees that have children that are gonna be sitting there. Um, I have a colleague just about every time we're in a Zoom meeting, a cat jumps up in the picture. Uh, we have folks you know, that have dogs and there's lots of different things that, that, that can happen there. And so simple things, you know, as, as Scott had mentioned, Blue Cross, not having meetings after four o'clock because that's more of a family time thing. And there's an acknowledgement that, you know, maybe if, if the schools are open, kids are probably coming home. So it, it's going to be more of a distraction for your employees or that, that backup child care and elder care to, to help the employees with these things can help minimize some of the negative psychological states that they're experiencing from working at home. And those are simple things that the organization can do. Now, what can managers do? I think the first thing that managers can do is ask their employees, how are you doing? And it doesn't just have to be, how are you doing, doing work, but ask them on a personal level. So um, I like these pictures you see on a scale of one uh, to nine based off these cat pictures. How do you feel? In all honesty, I'm probably all nine cats every single day. Okay, I'm really digging cat number five, just laying there lounging. Um, I think he's ready for the Mandalorian to be dropped on Disney Plus. So he, he's clearly ready to go for that. But let's just face facts. There are days uh, that you have all of those. Employees just want to know that someone will do something very simple, very nice and say, Sean, how are you doing today? You know, everything going okay? How are your kids doing? How is the family? Just simple compliment or simple acknowledgements of that you care. The second thing is find way to provide compliments. Thanking an employee for submitting something on time. Thanking an employee for submitting something. Um, an email uh, of acknowledgement to the, the department and saying, hey, great work, everyone. I would particularly like to highlight you know, these individuals who, who, are, who are doing fantastic. Um, everybody likes a little bit of a, a pat on the back. It makes them feel better. They, they want to know that they are appreciated and a compliment is something simple that can do that. Now, one thing I will tell you is, please stay away from tagging employees as essential, right? Because aren't they all essential? We've seen a lot of organizations who've come in and said, well, you're an essential employee, so you've got to come into work. And then there's other people that are telecommuting. Everybody's essential. It takes every single person in your organization to succeed through any instances, but especially through a global pandemic. We need everyone to succeed. A third thing that managers are going to have to do is be realistic, especially when they are evaluating performance, okay? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, like with time management, our employees are not able to do the things that they were able to do pre-COVID-19 because they may not have the same resources at home, such as the equipment that they need. Uh, we already know things are, are taking longer. 
So understand that, yes, the, the timing's gonna change, but also the productivity and the quality even may not be the exact same. And it would be disingenuous and unfair when we go through our annual review, if we are grading or evaluating our employees as if they should still be doing what they were doing when they were in the office. So find ways that we can be as realistic as possible. I, I like this cartoon. I think this is every one of us. You look at something, you're like, wow, I wanna cook this. Then you find out it's gonna take three hours and it's like, never mind, I'm calling Domino's. Um, that's just, or maybe that's just me. Fourth thing that we can do is find ways to make appropriate jokes, okay? Appropriate, appropriate, appropriate. I gotta make sure I say that for everybody in the back. But break up the, the monotonous two hour long Zoom meeting, okay? Um, I, I love my chancellor and, and the administrative uh, team that we have at UT Martin, because a lot of times, you know, when that meeting starts, if it's like Monday, they'll make fun of the other person's favorite football team because you know they, they may have just lost Saturday or they'll post a, 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 a funny graphic of some sort just to lighten the mood and, and to come up with a way of, of breaking that up. It gives everybody just kind of a chuckle for a second and then you can get into those, those issues. So finding ways to, to make those connections as a manager and it could be something simple like what Blue Cross did when they sent those gift boxes out, you know, those mailers with just little items. That may not seem like a lot to, to some folks, but the fact that someone took the time to figure out how to logistically send out those items to an, an organization who has, I think Scott said 6,700 employees, that's not easy. That's also not free. So the, to, to take that initiative and say, we care enough to do that or to send those signs and then get um, you know, people taking pictures and they're posting it to social media. And now everybody's getting to see what kind of an imprint um, and footprint your organization has with the employees. It, it's such a, a great way to get people psyched up to continue to work. Now, how can you as an employee also get psyched up? First off, dress up your office. Okay, whatever you, if you're at home, if you want to put, uh, you know, some, some posters up of Michael Jordan, because you grew up watching Michael Jordan, I've seen those, go for it. If you want to paint the walls, it, whatever you want to do to your office space, it's your office space. If that makes you happy, and that makes you want to be able to go in there and to work and get that work done, I say go for it. The second, but the second picture here is probably my favorite one. I call it the mullet of outfits, okay? You know, a mullet is party in the back, perfect business up front, your business uh, on top, your, your casual, relaxed on the bottom. Nobody knows unless you stand up in front of your Zoom screen if you're wearing shorts, okay? So if you want to wear shorts or jeans, if you want to take your shoes off, because you know at work, you can't do that all the time. You want to take your shoes off and you want to be able to sit there and be relaxed. It's your workspace. Be professional, you know, in the screen, but have fun. We probably all have seen the video that came out uh, at the beginning of this pandemic where the guy was in the Zoom meeting and he got up and he forgot to mute his video. That's another key thing, folks. If you're getting up and, you know, you don't want people to see things, mute your video. But he got up and he was wearing his boxers. And that was what he was wearing from the waist down. Now, I would not go that relaxed. I think you still need to have shorts. But, but be comfortable. Enjoy it. Have some fun. Wear that, wear that mullet of outfits. Uh, another thing you can do, music. You want to listen to music? Choose music appropriate to what you're trying to do. Uh, if I need to be calm because I'm trying to respond to uh, maybe an email from, from someone that I really need to be able to think, I like classical music. It really helps me you know, focus. Uh, if I need to speed up and get some work done, I like to put something a little bit faster paced, but find music that's appropriate. If you're in the middle of a Zoom meeting, obviously make sure you're muted so everybody else isn't hearing it. It's not distracting, but use music. There's no reason why you can't. Christmas is coming up. I'm ready to start blasting the Christmas music uh, in, in my home office. 
and nobody can tell me to turn it off. Another thing, Zoom backgrounds. I love Zoom backgrounds. These have been maybe the greatest single thing that Zoom could have helped us do during a pandemic to, to survive. Um, I would normally have Baby Yoda up here, but John threatened me and he said, no, we're going professional. So yeah, Scott switched his to show uh, uh, a, a different one. Zoom backgrounds are great. Um, we literally, in some of the meetings I've had, will do musical chairs with Zoom backgrounds to try to go through and all of a sudden someone puts a picture up of uh, you know, a Will Ferrell movie, or, you know, uh, there was one where we were doing sci-fi movies, and they went with Lord of the Rings, and Harry Potter, and all these things. It's just simple things that makes you feel uh, a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more comfortable. It might break up that meeting, uh, but it's nice when I tune in to a presentation, and I look, and I see different types of Zoom backgrounds instead of just that office, so go for it. Um, if you can, Take meetings outside. Boy, this third picture would be lovely if I had that outside. Actually, I would never return to the office if that was my outside. It, get out there. Um, you know, classrooms are moving outside. Office spaces are moving outside. There's just something about hearing nature, you know, feeling the breeze and, and such that just makes you feel better. And then the last thing you can do as an employee is take breaks when you need them. As Scott had mentioned, if you need to work from seven to nine, take a break for a while and then come back and work in the afternoon. You know, if you if you want to get up and start working from six until 730, take your kids to school and then come back at 830, start working again. You need to take a break at lunch. Uh, then you need to go pick your kids up. You got a doctor's appointment. You got to go to Walmart and pick things up. Do it. The, the big thing is flex your schedule so it fits your needs. And right now, as we all know, um, our needs have drastically changed with, with these things, especially if you are a parent and there's a school closure or a quarantine or an isolation, there's just different things that you're gonna do. So if you need that break, you take it. So these past three slides have been kind of focused on how to try to get ourselves a little bit maybe more hyped to work. What can we do moving forward uh, as organizations to try to succeed? Uh, when I first started talking to John about this, I told him one of the things that upset me the most in the spring was seeing just how negatively or adversely impacted organizations were. You know, yes, we expected a drop, obviously, in revenues, but when you're seeing the restaurant industry dropping 70 and 80% revenues, you know, they, they can't offset that. That's people's jobs and livelihoods that are being lost at that point in time. So what are some things that we can do so that we can minimize these things if there should be a surge this fall, uh, whether it's a second wave or a, who knows, new virus. Flammable snow is coming in December, folks. I've got it on my bingo card. I'm just letting you all know right now, flammable snow, mark it. Uh, first thing you can do, uh, there are unique different types of compensation packages you can do. Uh, you can ask your employees to work fewer hours so we don't have to terminate anyone. So you know maybe your revenues are down 10%. Are you going to let go of 10% of your work staff? Or are you going to ask people, hey, would we be willing to all tighten our belts together and cut uh, our hours by 10%? Um, there are also organizations that are doing the same thing with their hourly wages. Okay, So they're basically saying, yes, on average, everyone was making $10 an hour. Would we be willing to, for, the, for right now, go back down to $9 average so that we are not having to let folks go, especially right now this season with Christmas coming up, and children are gonna be wanting gifts and spouses are gonna be wanting gifts and, and, and things of that nature. Another thing that you can do is you can promote deferment of compensation. For any of my Major League Baseball fans, um, Bobby Bonilla is probably the greatest example of this. He stopped playing Major League Baseball in 2001. He will be receiving a paycheck from the New York Mets until 2035. He took less money while he was going through his uh, last uh, contract seasons so that he could draw those things out. So if you see that the organization is, is running into some issues, there are some ways to try to adjust that. I'm not saying you have to. Um, second thing that we can do, kind of going to Scott's point, telecommute. Maybe previously you didn't think about telecommuting this particular job, this position. Well, I think now we need to start having some really tough conversations and saying, 
does Sally really need to come into the office to do this? Or can we provide her with the comforts uh, and, and the uh, confidence of being at home and taking care of her obligations? Or does Joe need to actually come in every day? Or could we do something where 40% of the time they're able to telecommute the rest they come in? We can amend our assignments. Major League Baseball, um, if there was a doubleheader, they did not go to nine innings, they went to seven innings. Do we really need to have people in from eight to five? Do we really need to have the same people in? Can we create a rotation? You know, think of it as like an assembly line. If, if we need, um, you know, Ricky and Scott and John to do things, but Ricky does his first, then Scott, then John, then have Ricky come in, then he can go home, then Scott comes in, then he can go, go home, and then John can work. And so you can amend the assignments, you can make it flexible to fit their needs, and you can still get the work done. This next one, I think the MBA gave higher education a really good idea for how to succeed if cases go up. Organizations, especially higher ed, can create bubbles. If cases were to go up significantly on a college campus, to the point where you're thinking about sending some the, the students home, First off, we need to acknowledge that sometimes that's actually more dangerous to the students than keeping them there. Because if you look at positivity rates, it's significantly higher in their home communities typically than it is at school. Second thing is there are some disciplines, some professions, some jobs that you cannot do and or learn via Zoom. So we have to find what, you know, I would not want to learn how to play a musical instrument, do pottery, anything in the arts, nursing, ag, if I'm working, you know, in vet tech with, with animals uh, and things of that nature. Um, I really don't want to go to a nurse here in six months who learned how to draw blood through a Zoom session or a YouTube video, right? I want them to have actually been in the classroom and to have learned these things. So if we can find ways to create those bubbles like the MBA did, that will be much more beneficial than, than just the, the mass exodus like we saw in the spring. And then the last thing, find ways to change our business model. Uh, there's a restaurant in um, the state of Washington that they went and bought tents and put them up outside in the parking lot. And they then added an inflatable drive-in screen. And so they were able to space the tables out. They were outside, so there weren't the, the indoor ventilation issues that a lot of restaurants were having. Um, and they were able to basically continue their normal services that they would provide, but in this outdoor setting. It's just like if you're on a college campus and you want to still teach classes and you don't want to only teach 10 kids, see if you can implement tents outside that will still allow for, for uh, appropriate spacing. Or another example I just read the other day, um, there are restaurants up north that are researching what Japan does. Apparently um, outdoor dining, even in the winter is apparently a big thing in Japan. They use heated tables. And so there's a lot of different restaurants that are trying to figure out how they can continue to operate as seamlessly as possible with minimal effects. Is this a mutually exhaustive list? No, it's not, but I do think it's some, some good ideas to maybe spur some, some thought and some brainstorming for all the organizations. Uh, that's all I have on my time, uh, but I, I appreciate everybody listening, and uh, obviously, I'm willing to answer any questions anyone may have. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Scott. And yeah, let's dive into some questions. We have um, one right off the bat here, and let's see, let me scroll to it here, um, from our poll winner at the beginning of the session. Okay, uh, Raphael would like to know Scott's opinion about when things will be back to normal. Hmm. Well, <laughs> I'll start by saying I'm a communicator, not a physician, but I listen every uh, morning. Well, now it's Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We have a leadership call and our uh, chief medical officer does give an overview. And this question has been asked and the answer can't really be stated until there, there are some factors that have to be in place. How effective will the vaccine be? It's unlikely it'll be as effective as say measles, which is 98%, right? But if it's somewhere around 75 to 80% effective, 
and there's a heavy uptake of people actually taking the vaccine. Then, and if in the meanwhile, people stay socially distanced and wear masks, you might see a return to what we would consider normal by the third quarter of 2021. Now, this is, again, I'm not making a statement. I'm telling you what I've heard under certain conditions. But the fact is, of course, where I live, people are starting to slip on uh, social distancing and wearing masks and we don't have a vaccine. So it's not knowable until some conditions are in place to conquer this uh, virus. Thanks, Scott. Sean, anything you wanna to add to that? No, I, I completely agree with Scott. This is, it's just, it's a tough situation. Um, also, I will admit, I'm not sure we'll ever go back to what we used to call normal. Not to use the phrase that a lot of people like to use now, because I, I think everyone dreads it, but the new normal. But I, I think there are going to be, there's going to be some things that we have changed that we're going to need to continue doing. And there are some things that we need to get back to, you know, and, and, and one of those is the whole telecommuting component. I think we really need to look at things and say, what positions can we still allow those employees to be able to work from home even once things are safe to bring them back? And then what positions do we need to bring those individuals back? But that'll probably be a case-by-case -case basis. We, as I mentioned, we had less than a third, which was still a really high number, that 2,000 people were working from home before this hit. But now, uh, as I mentioned in the chat, we surveyed our employees, those who were eligible to return and said, you've been working from home, what do you think? And now we had such heavy uptake, we will be majority work from home. 56% as of this week have chosen to permanently work from home of our employees across the state. Um, so I only see that number going up, which as a communicator, now I have a whole different challenge. It's, it's fine with print, but we do a lot of things on campus, you know, which is back before the virus. So I don't even know how to do that, but you know, just fairs and food and things like that, which now I have to remember most of my people aren't here for that. So I have to package something up and send it out or, you know, so it's gonna be a whole new world um, when this is over. Uh, and and it, the COVID definitely is accelerating change. And I think that uh, there's an upside to that. So Scott, Sean, I got a, a, a an interesting question um, from the perspective of the people who are, are working from home that actually enjoy working from home and are productive. Um, give us a little bit of guidance um, or direction for those people who, who are being productive during this time of working from home that may um, have a company that is, is really looking forward to getting their people back to the office. What kind of advice could you share to them that, um, that they could take back to their company to consider maybe this new normal of, of the productivity that we're getting out of people um, instead of just immediately bringing everybody back um, should the pandemic you know, go away. You want to go, Sean, or shall I? You can go first and then I'll add on. So what I, <laughs> I happen to work for a company that when we ask our employees a question, we listen. And I can go small with that. I was just, uh, before this started, I ran to the gentleman's and as I was washing my hands, I was chuckling because we had a share at work about the environment, what can make it better? And someone wrote, when I wash my hands and I go to get a towel, water drips on the floor. I wish there was a mat so that the floor is not slippery. And now under every paper towel <laughs> dispenser in every bathroom on Cameron Hill, there is a rubber mat catching water. So what I would say is listen to your employees. If it is possible, I don't know what you might do, but if you're Step back honestly and look at your business and say, do I have to be, and this is something we faced with management, uh, management of a certain age felt like managing is looking at my employees. Can I see what they're doing? And that's not going to work in, in this environment. You're going to have to have an environment of trust. And, you know, like for people who work our phones, we know if you're taking those calls, we know how long they last. And then we follow up with random survey. So we know, how, you know, and so it doesn't do any good to, you know, there are ways of verifying if you're working and you need to put those in place. But I would say, ask your people, 
and then try to follow their wishes because you're going to have a better engaged staff if they're happy where they are. And I admit, I never thought I'm Gen X. I went to work when I was in high school after, after school and weekends and paid my way through college and then went right to work. So I've been working since I was 14 years old, basically. I thought I was going to be miserable. And candidly, there's a whole bunch I like about working from home. Um, I, I do miss people, but I love spending the day at home and working with the dogs and I'm much chiller. So uh, I think there's a lot of uh, change that's gonna come after COVID and work from home is one of the principal ones. And if I could add, um, I'll take more of the employee's perspective of this. Um, you know, when, when you make that request, the organization says we want to bring you back. I think you've got to explain to them why it would benefit them that you don't come back. Okay, don't just say, hey, I want to stay and, and make it about yourself. That can be included. But um, think back to when you were 16 and you were trying to convince mom or dad you should get a car, right? What, what did you do? The, the successful ones seem to always, now, mom, if I get this car, I'll be able to take my younger siblings to practice so that you won't have to deal with this. Make it about the benefits of the organization, right? This will help me with responsibility. Dad, I can get a job and I'll pay for my gas. Like help the organization see why it is actually going to improve things. Uh, you know, Scott noted Blue Cross was already doing some of this. There have been organizations in the last 10 to 15 years that have been utilizing more telecommuting. And part of it that they've realized is it decreases overhead if you're not running those lights and running the water in the bathroom and using the paper towels and, and things of that nature. But as we develop and build our newer facilities for headquarters and things like that, do we need a 10,000 square foot facility or do we need a 5,000 square foot facility because we can get half the folks to be able to work from home and we don't need that office space? Or if we do need 10,000, can we repurpose that square footage that would have went into those offices? Now we can think about expanding our brand by doing extra things or we now have the, the physical capacity to, to put the, the, the technology into that location that we would need so that uh, we can run reliable Zoom meetings and, and run reliable uh, classes and, and things of that nature uh, over the internet. So I think if you can find some, some verifiable, justifiable ways that it's going to benefit the organization, not just yourself, then I think organizations will, to Scott's point, listen. Very good. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, uh, thanks Scott. So our next question, um, Scott, is actually um, directed a little bit towards you. Um, so you talked about the not having meetings after 4 p.m. and the transition into the family time. Um, how has that gone for Blue Cross Blue Shield? What obstacles may have you had to overcome with, you know, everybody kind of transitioning out at four o'clock? Um, and so the idea is um, not to, for instance, and obviously if a client needs something or a customer this this has to happen but the idea is i as a as a vice president i can model this behavior by not booking meetings at 4 p.m or during lunch right and i can encourage my directors and managers to do the same because if an employee is on a zoom meeting this is one thing as opposed to maybe you're handling some email at 4 15 as the kids get active after their study and the dog wants fed, right? So it's not like the day is over, but the thing where you are having to shush people and your boss is right in your face, that is tapering off. So your day can start blending with family time. Um, and again, as I said, for my team, do the work when you have to do the work. I really do think that um, family during this time has to come first or there's gonna be a lot of negative consequences and those negative consequences are gonna back up on my staff. They're gonna be less happy, they're gonna be less effective. So I feel like prioritizing family is gonna pay off eventually in the big picture. So it's gone well. And what I see is a lot of sort of um, gentle chiding when there is some, someone book something because X has to happen, you know, things happen. But you get like, all right, it's 4.15, let's speed this up, you know. So it, I think it's been effective and I can only speak for 
corporate communications and community relations, but it seems to be going well. It's having the effect I wanted. Good. Hey guys, a uh, question here. Um, let me scroll to here. When do you uh, and your staff, when, you, when your staff is on a rotating schedule, um, most work can only be done in the office. So for those that are at home during their rotation, there are only so many trainings and work available. Uh, this person struggles as a manager with the fact that those at home simply don't have enough to do. Is there any ideas that will help this person with this struggle? Does that make I'm sense? I'm not seeing this question. Where is this? Uh, it's, it's just a one that was sent directly to me. Okay. I, I didn't quite catch that. Let me rephrase. Okay. Okay. So what do you do when your staff is on a rotating schedule? Most work can only be done in the office. So for those that are at home during their rotation, there are only so many trainings and work available. This person struggles as a manager with the fact that those at home simply don't have enough to do. Is there any ideas that you all would recommend that will help them overcome this challenge? You want to go, Sean? Well, I mean, not knowing the specific job makes uh, an answer kind of hard, but um, I, I think what I would do as the manager is, is have a conversation with that employee. Let's, let's find out how much downtime uh, they really are having at home. And let's see if there's some other things that have been added at work that that person could do from home. You know, for example, being on a university campus, if we had an employee that he was on that rotation, um, could we train them to do something else that would help somebody in a different department? You know, we're in the era of contact tracing for a lot of organizations. So could we train that person to be able to make phone calls from home, something that they could easily do to find out who our employees have been around? Now, if the organization already has people that are uh, specifically focused on that, that might not work. But I, I think we just, we, more work has been created now. So instead of just piling that on to everybody, let's find ways that when they have that time, that downtime at home, let's take some of that additional work and see if they can't do that from home or from a alternative workstation. Uh, again, it doesn't necessarily have to be inside the office. There's been some organizations coming up with outside offices that they could still have access to. Uh, Scott? Yeah, our, our situation is different because everyone is able, because we're this tech company, and our company, everyone is largely able to work from home. We have an on-site staff we call the lights on team, again, avoiding words that uh, rank people, but, uh, and, and they are lights on team because again, we, there are computers here, massive ones that need to be maintained to keep these systems running. Keeping those people healthy was very important, which is why they're sort of isolated here. Um, but I will say this, like on just my teams, there are some people, admins and, um, <clears throat> and um, newer employees whose work generally uh, comes down and, and they have had a light, lighter workload. So the first thing I did was give them a break. I just said, listen, I'm not going to be looking over your shoulder for what you're doing when, of course, what you were doing did have to do with being in person and, and running this down and putting that package together or whatever. But I did say, we have a lot of training on, on that's available um, through our intranet. Take advantage of it. You know, I mean, be, be available when we need you. And when we do give you work, obviously that comes first, but we've got a whole lot of things you can do or that you could pursue in your education because they tended to be younger or people who were still in that field. So I gave them a break and I encouraged them to find a, a, a good outlet for, to improve their situation here at work. Um, but again, our situation is largely that we are fully engaged remotely. <clears throat> Sorry. Thanks guys. And Anne-Marie, uh, you had a nice comment in here. Do you care to, let me unmute you and uh, share it with the rest of the group here. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yes, um, I was just saying it is a good time for people to kind of work on themselves and expand their knowledge of different things in the workplace. I find um, working in community relations for a hospital that um, it's we're now re-looking at how are we going to reach people 
um, and provide those services that were in person um, to the most vulnerable that maybe don't have internet access. Um, but again, it's still always our option to educate and get out there. And so we're looking and assessing what are the best platforms? What are the things that we should be using that are easy? Um, we have a campaign we're looking at, um, Black Men in White Coats. How do we do it virtually now and really work with the school systems to then tap in those people? Uh, because we know that the statistics are still low. We need to reach the community um, that we've designated um, through our community health needs assessment. Thank so you, it's Sam. a learning process. Absolutely. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Appreciate you You're jumping welcome. in there. Any additional questions from our audience? I'd like to shout out to Jonathan Hagen, who's a BCBST employee, and I believe he is a Chattanooga Football Club fan like myself, based on his shout out earlier. So, hey, John. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Jonathan, thanks for joining us. I'd also like to thank all my UT Martin friends and family who've joined on here. I recognize several names. And also to our youngest participant that has clearly fallen asleep after they <laughs> listened to me for 15 to 30 seconds. <laughs> you said it would, Sean. You, you did a good job. Put him right to sleep. So thanks for that. Well, if, that, if we don't have any more questions, um, we're just gonna go to Sean and Scott's uh, key takeaways from today's session. So um, let me just pull these up for us here. Okay. So Sean. All right, so my first key takeaway uh, from this discussion is it takes everyone to succeed. Uh, this is not just a CEO or a president that's gonna get us through this. Uh, this is not management that's going to get us through this. This is everybody working together will get our organizations through this. And it's not just intra-organizationally, it's inter-organizationally, right? It's, it's the fact that the UT system is providing this, this forum where folks from different backgrounds and different experiences and different organizations can come together and can discuss some of the, the hard things that we're dealing with and I have learned a, a lot from, from Scott and what Blue Cross is doing that I will then be able to, you know, discuss here at UT Martin or discuss with other organizations about ways that you can engage the employees and get them psyched up to want to wanna be able to work from home. And then my second takeaway is that if, if we think outside of the box, we will find ways to expand the box. You know, right now we feel very confined because we are at home in these confined spaces. But like I said, with taking uh, your work outside, you don't have to just be in this confined box right now. We can, we can find new and creative ways to adapt and to succeed. And again, it's all through us working together. And Scott? Yeah, so mine, mine's pretty simple um, to communicate. The, the only mistake you make is uh, to not do so and of course, empathetically. Um, I constantly think about what it's like for my employees at home and how we can mitigate uh, this strange situation. And it's actually led to lots of great opportunities for our company to grow and change. Um, and um, I think disruptive events like this, they just tend to accelerate what was already happening. Work from home was happening and it was growing as broadband um, becomes available throughout our state um, and country. And this uh, allowed, allowed us to move that forward in a way that our employees wanted. Um, we were able to respond to that uh, because we survey them and the ones that do go home like it. Now, mind you, there are a lot of people, um, for some reason, my, my millennial and Gen Zs are eager to get back to the office. Um, the personal communicating for them is very important. And honestly, they, they sort of bang on my door a lot, uh, you, not literally, um, but <clears throat> they want to be sure, you know, because we're going to come back in waves. And they're like, I want to be in the first wave. And that's fine because we are coming back. And we, we're deep in planning for that for January, just FYI. Um, but uh, communicating 
um, empathetically is crucial, is the bottom line. Thank you all. Thank you all. And maybe just one last call for any questions that anybody wants to unmute and ask it live, uh, that'd be great. We'll give a little more time for that. Yeah, Julie said that um, he took good notes, but had an obligation to attend one of his dad's Zooms at 11. So <laughs> it wasn't you, Sean. You didn't put him to sleep. Sorry, buddy. I'm not, I'm not seeing any, John. All right. Well, hey, thank you all so very much for being with us today. Great session. Uh, Scott, Sean, thank you guys for giving us all this information, knowledge, and wisdom, and for your time. And it's really fun. So um, we have... More webinars coming up, and uh, one tomorrow actually, from the Adventure Science Center on how they shifted their business model. And following election week, we've got a whole slew coming at you as well. So be sure and check those out. But uh, again, thank you all so much for attending, and we'll be sending you a survey as well as a link to this recorded webinar so that you can watch it. Uh, you know, ten more times between now and holiday break. So thank you all again, <laughs> and we'll look forward to seeing you at some more. Uh, webinar soon. Thanks all. Bye. Everybody have a good day. Thank you, everyone.